Has the world gone crazy? Life is difficult. When you need help, where do you turn? Are you willing? Are you willing to let him blow on the coals of your heart? Are you willing? Are you willing to ignite that flame? To let him blow and ignite that flame? And set you on fire. And set you on fire to consume this county, to consume this state, to consume this world. Welcome. Christian Impact, impacting your life with spiritual truth. I am Dr. Kelly Blanton, and I'm sharing practical truths in the Bible that can truly change your life. Today is August 9th, 2023. We continue our series, Words for Life, and today's word is striving. And as we get into this message, I always ask questions, and so our questions for this message is, do you play games with God? You know, like you play hide and seek with God, maybe a little dodgeball. Or does it really take a major crisis in your life for you to get in the ring with God? You know, unfortunately, most people are sort of hard cases. And what I mean by that is that they play games with God and therefore they're weak Christians. And I say that they're hard people because they claim a form of Christianity. This goes into some of the teachings I've done on religion and religious people where you just get the I know, I know, don't talk to me. But they're striving in life. And now, if you're listening to this podcast, I would hope that you are someone that's seeking the Lord. If you're not seeking the Lord, Uh, This podcast is not exactly entertaining, so I would assume you just turn it off. So you're listening because you're seeking, but just because you're seeking doesn't mean you're not striving as well in life. And as Christians, God is wanting to speak to us. His word striving. Do you find yourself striving? And so when I was praying and preparing and looking at lectionary scriptures to challenge me to prophetically minister the word of God. And this word striving just kept coming up in my spirit that you can be a solid Christian. You can love God, but you you find yourself striving in life. And sometimes it's because we're playing games with God. And when you do this, it comes out in our actions. It's visible in our actions. Now, we don't always label it as such, but it's there. And you see, our actions, they don't, they don't like to face certain issues. This, when we're playing with God, we don't want to face certain things. And you see, our actions are shown because of our doubt and how we face reality. And when I say face reality, I'm talking about fear. See, fear and doubt come out and that produces striving in our life now let's look at our lectionary readings and see where we can find striving in these passages of scripture we're going to begin with the lectionary reading in romans chapter 9 verses 1 through 13 it reads i tell you the truth in christ i'm not lying My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But that it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For are they not all Israel who are of Israel? Nor are they all children because they are a seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. 
And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. As it was written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now here we are with this passage in Romans. And you see, Paul, he's struggling. He's striving. What is he struggling and striving with? Because his people fellow Jews, are not coming to know Christ. And this is causing strife in the life of the Apostle Paul. You see, he loves his people. These are his Jewish brethren. And he loves them. He goes on to talk about how it is the the Israelites, the Jews who had the covenants, the giving of the law, the promises, the service, the miracles, all this stuff, even Jesus himself came up out of them. All this stuff, and yet they're missing it. They're missing it because of this religious idea. They think that it's just because of their blood and privilege. And Paul's like, well, no, that's not what makes you a seed of Abraham. It's it's faith. And you need faith in Christ. Because he is God. He is the incarnate word made flesh. He is the way to salvation. And, And Paul, who was once like them, has seen the light, but they're not joining in. And this is causing strife. And he even talks about if he could take their place in hell. And this is strong words. It comes from the words of a man that deeply loves, but he also understands that he can't do that. But he wishes that they would, and it causes strife. Let me tell you what. There's nothing like having strife in your family or in, quote, your people. And that's what your family is. Your close friends, your family, they are your people. And when they do not want to believe Oh, it causes strife. It causes you to strive. And it's because you're tempted, just like Paul, to be the, quote, this is to be the peacemaker. You know, don't, don't ruffle feathers. Don't, don't talk about Jesus. Just, just don't do it. You need to be, you need to be a peacemaker. See, this is, this is the voice of the enemy that speaks to you. Now, I know as Christians, we're called to be peacemakers, but you know, the devil, he likes to twist those words. But Paul never sacrificed his witness. And he understood that his witness was going to be strife and persecution. And he didn't back away from that, even though it caused strife in his life, because it was the truth and his his brethren whom he loved, if he didn't give it to them, who would? I've come from a family that threw me out of the house when I became a believer. And there were and there was strife even to this day. With family members. Does it hurt? Yes. But you have to stand strong for the truth. Because if you give in and you just, you stay silent, you're condemning the people you love to hell. You are. You're you're condemning them because you're not giving them the light. That message of Christ has come to you and God's calling and purposes in you. We are to be salt and light. And if we can't be it to them, then we... How can we be it to somebody else? Is it easier to share the gospel with strangers? Well, sure it is. Because in the end, you have no emotional attachment to a stranger. You may have the love of God for them, but if they laugh at you, you can always turn away and say, you know what, I didn't know you beforehand and I don't have to know you again. It's easy to walk away. That's why it's easy to share with a stranger. But, But family, even if they throw you out and you don't see them, for decades or ever it's the, the the that emotional relational blood connection it stays with you and that's and that and that causes a strife and some of us were so the temptation is there but we we, we can't do that we, we need to stand up we need to overcome this just like what paul shares here shares in this in this passage 
He's standing up, and even in the midst of him talking about this, his love and strife, he begins preaching on why they are the way they are, because they think that it's, it's blood and it's, it's, it's his faith, and he goes into a teaching about it, because he wants them to know the truth. Now let's read another passage in Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed the sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about five thousand men, besides women and children. I know this is a popular, well-known story about Jesus feeding the five thousand. But they're striving here. They're striving here. And it's in the disciples. You see, here's the disciples in the situation. And there's This multitude of people. There's 5,000 men. That's not counting women and children. That's just men. So if the families were there, the man and a wife and two, three, four kids, maybe more. You know, they had large families back in this time. Um, There could have been very easily 10, 15,000 people. We don't know. All we know is there's 5,000 men plus women and children. It's a lot of people. I mean, my guess would be at least 10,000 because, you know, I know you got some single men, but how many women and children do you have for every man? You know, I mean, if, if, if even if one third of the men were married and with kids, you've already made up for the other two thirds on, on a double. I know I'm just giving you an opinion. I'm, I'm, I'm talking now, but there's all these people. And so here they are, all these people, they've come to hear Jesus. They're all hungry. And Jesus is speaking in the city because where would the people come to hear him? You know, Jesus isn't exactly renting amphitheaters and stadiums and coliseums. And so they would go out in the wilderness. There's lots of room. They can sit on the mountainside. They can sit in the fields. There's, there's lots of room for thousands of people to come and listen to him outside of a city. And so they're there. That means there's, they're outside of a city, there's not places to get food. There's no homes. There's no kitchens. There's no restaurants. There's no vendors. There's no, they're just out in the wilderness. Most of them didn't bring food. They just, they just came to hear him. Their, their spiritual hunger took them places when they didn't have anything. And so here it is. It's evening. It's a deserted place. And the disciples are like up. Oh, We need to go to bed. We need to eat. Jesus, send these people away. Now, let's just think about this. They wanted Jesus to send them away. Since when does Jesus send anyone away? When does Jesus say, go away, I'm not sufficient? He doesn't. And think about the disciples were like, they need food. We don't have it. They must go get it somewhere else. Send them to the villages. Send them... In essence, it's like, Lord, we can't provide for them. Send them back to the world to get their food. Do you strive like this? Do you, as a believer, do you find yourself striving that you want to serve God? You want to do things for the Lord? And yet you go, I need this. Therefore, I have to serve the world. And, and, and you're, you think your provision comes from the world and you feel like you're living in two different places. When they tell Jesus, this, Jesus is like, they don't need to go away. He is their everything. He has everything they need. And he's like, no, they're here with me. They don't need to go anywhere. 
for anything. They don't have to go striving in villages and places. I, I can, I'm the provision. That's Jesus. And then he tells his disciples, you feed them. Now imagine their shock when Jesus says, you feed them. They must be thinking, what is Jesus thinking? What is Jesus telling us? To, we don't have any food. If anything, they're thinking, well, you're supposed to be the Messiah. You should have all the food, right? See, Jesus is telling them to do it because they have him, therefore they have everything. You see, this causes strife. And in believers, the same thing happens to us all the time with our dealings with the world. We have to work a job. We have to have bills to pay. We have to, we have to do things. And yet, Jesus is saying, you don't need to go away and you feed them. Can you understand the disciples had fear and doubt? How are we going to do this? And so they, they turn and they tell Jesus, look, we only had five loaves and two fishes. How many times have we told God, God, I've only got five bucks in my bank account. Lord, I've only got a few dollars. Lord, I, I can't do this. I don't have the resources to do this. I've been very blessed. I've worked in churches as I've come up that had godly leadership and pastors Godly men, godly leaders. I, w I don't want to speak bad of them, but I've also seen all these situations, some better than others, but I've seen them at some point give pause with an idea and they go, we can't do that because we don't have X. We don't have enough money to do that. We don't have enough resources to do that. We don't. We're not large enough as a, as a congregation to do this. Maybe as a person just working a job, you're not, you're not a minister, you're not a pastor, you're not running a church, but you know what? God's still called you to be a minister of this world. Have you said, but God, I can't, I can't do X, X, or X because I'm not rich, I don't have enough money, or I don't have the resources, or I don't have the education, or I don't have the, whatever the excuse is. And Jesus is what? Bring what you have to me. For them it was, when he says, bring him here to me, he's talking about the fish and the loaves. Jesus calls us to take to him what we have. Give to him what we have, and then he multiplies it to complete the job. He multiplies the fish and the loaves to feed the people. I have seen it time and time again. I've seen it in the lives of other people, especially in ministry, where God tells us to do something. We don't have the resources, but we take what we have, we present it to Him, and then we just use what we have, and suddenly God multiplies it. It stretches. It goes and does things that we don't think it should. And suddenly, the thing that God told us to do gets accomplished. Well, why do we strive? Why do we do this? Let's look at our last passage. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 5. It says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. Now here we have this passage in Isaiah. It's another prophetic passage speaking about the Messiah and the words of Jesus. But you know, this almost sounds word for word like Jesus. Can you imagine that the Word of God sounds like the Word of God? Because if you look at 
John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. I know I'm going off of my lectionary reading a little bit. But this is what I instantly saw in my mind when I read Isaiah 55. John 7, 37 and 38. And on the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Powerful. It's powerful. Because here in Isaiah, in this prophetic message, it says, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come by and eat. You know that you have no money reminds me of Revelation 3.18. I'm not going to read that one, but that's the church of Laodicea that Jesus is speaking to and prophesying to. And the church of Laodicea is the lukewarm church. Are you seeing where this is coming from? The lukewarm, the, the weak Christians? They're the ones that say, I don't have it. I don't need anything. I have everything I need. I'm good. These are the ones that I just drive me nuts because they go, oh, I know that. I know that. And then they don't listen to you anymore because they, they think that because they've heard the Bible story, they've heard the scripture given to them, that they know it all. And it doesn't apply to them because they won't know it. They don't really know it. And Jesus says, you're not rich, you're poor, you're naked, you're wretched. And then he tells him, come, buy gold refined in the fire. Now, how can you buy gold, refined gold, when you have no money and you're poor and wretched? Here he says, you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. See, this is the Lord speaking to you and I. Here we are striving in life, striving to do our best. Lord, I, I'm trying my best to serve you, but, 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 fill in the blanks with whatever your but excuse is. It's okay. I'm like you. I'm human. We all do it. It goes on and says, why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. This is the Lord speaking to us. You see, he's saying, why are you striving? Why are you striving with the world? Why are you striving with your people? Your relatives, your friends, your co-workers. Why are you striving? Why are you striving with not having enough? Why are you striving trying to make money? And the Lord say, listen carefully to me and eat what is good. You see, we're supposed to come to him and he will provide what we need. We need to come to him. It says, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Listen, our strife, our striving is not with the world and I need more money and I need more stuff. I need clothes. I need a better job. I need a car. I would say maybe you're homeless, but I don't know if you're homeless, how you'd be listening to a podcast unless you got some free government phone or something. I don't, I don't know. But no matter what your situation is, your striving is not about physical. See, when we strive, we don't have peace and peace is an issue of the soul. It's an issue of your mind. That striving is a matter of your soul. That's why in the scripture in Isaiah, this is verse two, about two and a half, it says, listen careful, carefully to me and he was good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear to me. This is verse three. Incline your ear to me and come to me here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. You see, the Lord wants us to put down this striving. Because you see, it's, it's, it's a war in your soul. And the Lord's saying, listen, I can give you abundance in your soul. This isn't a physical thing. This isn't one of these things that, oh, come to the Lord and you get rich. No, this is the Lord is going to put abundance in your soul, in your mind. His, your peace 
that passes understanding will fill your soul. It guards your mind. It helps you to be firm in Him. And that when you do this, when you come to Him, He makes His everlasting covenant. This is like the words of Jesus where He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Where He says, I will be with you to the end of the age. And then it goes on and says, Indeed, I have given Him a witness to the people, a leader and commander of the people. Yes, Jesus is our leader. He's he's our commander that's been given to us. But Jesus has called us. He's commissioned us to be witnesses. You know, if he's the commander, commander have troops. We're the troops. He's our head, but he's, he's calling us to be that witness. And notice it says, surely you shall call a nation you do not know. And nations who do not know you. Listen, that word nations there, it's not just talking about a line on a map nations. This is talking about ethnic nations, people of other ethnicities, of other cultures. You know, I, when I was talking about your family and friends, I go, well, these are your people. In this aspect, these nations, they're not your people. They may be, like for me, they may be fellow Americans or fellow Texans. You know, they might even be from the same part of the city I'm living in. But they're not, they're not my flesh and blood. They're not maybe my, my friends, close associates. They're not, they're not part of that. You know, they're not, they're not my quote people. They're not my tribe, my clan, my whatever word of definition you want to culturally throw at it. But God says what? Cause we strive for those things. But God says, I'm going to bring people to you that you don't know and they're going to run to you and they're going to become a nation. You're going to become a nation with these people. What's your nation? Your nation is the nation of heaven. It's the kingdom of God. You're all going to become citizens in God's kingdom, God's people, brothers and sisters. We are a people together. Nations who don't even know us are going to run. Why? Because of the Lord our God. Listen. The Lord loves you and he's speaking to you and I today that it's time to end our striving. It's time to end our weakness. It's time to put an end to our doubts and fears. He wants to fulfill us. He wants to give us purpose. He wants to glorify us. How does he glorify us? When we come to him and he becomes our everything and he fills us and he works his work in us. We are glorified. He's not here for us to be defeated. He's here for us to overcome through him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, God. I thank you that you're talking to us about our striving in this world, God. Father, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit, God, that yes, that our souls would delight ourselves in you and that you would pour out your abundance into our souls, God. That, Lord, the peace that passes understanding should guard our hearts. And that, Father, we would find an everlasting fellowship with you, God. That you would fill us with your living waters that would just flow out of us, God. That we would eat the bread of your word and revelation that would speak to us. And that, God, we would be a witness. A witness to the people around us. Just the same way Paul was a witness, God. Make us a witness, God, that we would stand firm, God, that we wouldn't cower, we wouldn't compromise the message, but that we would present it knowing that you're going to bring people, brothers and sisters, into your kingdom. Lord, and we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we thank you for listening to this teaching and this podcast series. You can check out other teachings on our website, www.christianimpact.com. Dot net, and until next time, God bless. Oh.